From the Cube Studios in Palo Alto and Boston, connecting with thought leaders all around the world, this is a Cube Conversation. Hey, welcome back everybody. Jeff Frick here with the Cube. We're in our Palo Alto studios, you know, kind of continuing our leadership coverage, uh, reaching out to the community for people that we've got in our community to get their take on, you know, how they're dealing with the COVID crisis, how they're helping to contribute back to the community to to uh, to bring their resources to bear, and you know, just some general good tips and tricks of getting through these kind of challenging times. And we're really excited to have one of my favorite guests. He's been used to come on all the time. We haven't had him on for three years, which I can't believe. It's Abi Mehta. Uh, the CEO of Traseda, founder of Traseda. Abi, I, I checked the record. I can't believe it's been three years since we last sat down. Great to see you. Jeff, there's, well, first of all, it's always a pleasure. And I think the only person to blame for that is you, Jeff. <laughs> well, I will make sure <laughs> that it doesn't happen again. So, uh, and just to check in, how's things going with the family, the company? Thank you for asking. You know, family is great. We have, uh, I've got two young kiddos who have become video conferencing experts. And they now teach me the tricks uh, for it, which I'm sure is happening in a lot of families around the world. And the team is great. We went remote uh, at this point almost uh, almost two months ago now and can't complain. I think we are in an intellectual property business like you are. So it's been a little easier for us to go remote compared to a lot of other businesses in the world and in America. But no complaints. You know, we're very fortunate. Um, we, are, we are glad that we have a business and a company that can withstand um, the, the economic uncertainty. And the family is great. I hope the same for the Q family. I haven't seen Dave and John, and it's good to see you again. And I hope all of you guys are ha happy and healthy. Great, I think, and we're good. So thank you for asking. So let's jump into it. You know, one of the things that that I've always loved about you is, you, you know, really your sense of culture and this kind of constant reinforcing of culture in your social media posts and the company blog posts at Traseda, you know, celebrating your interns and, and you really have a good pulse for that. And, you know, I just, I think we may have even talked about it before about, you know, kind of the CEOs and leadership and, and social media, those that do and those that, and those that don't. And, you know, I think it's, it's, it's probably for many kind of a risk reward trade off. You know, I could say something mm -hmm. stupid versus what am I getting at it, but really, it's super important, and in these times with the distributed workforce, the, the, the importance and value of communicating and culture and touching uh, your people frequently across a lot of different mediums and topic areas is, is more important than ever before. Share with us kind of your strategy. Why did you figure this out early? How have you, you know, kind of adjusted you know, your method of, of keeping your team up and communicating? Absolutely, like I, I guess I owe you guys a, a little bit of gratitude for it, uh, which is we launched our company and you, I'm sure you remember on the cube, it was a social media launch. Uh, you know, if you may say that, say it like that. I think there are two or three things that are very important, uh, Jeff, and you hit on all of them. One is the emphasis on information sharing. Um, it becomes more important in times like these and we as, as, you know, as a society value the, the, the ability to share a positive conversation, a positive perspective, and a positive outlook more. But since day zero at Preseta, we've had this philosophy that there are no secrets. It is important to be open and transparent, both inside and outside the company, and that our legacy is going to be defined by what we do for the community and not just what we do for our shareholders. And by its very nature, the fact that you know I grew up in a different continent and I live and call America Know, a different continent, my home. Uh, I guess I would, it's very important for me to stay connected to my roots. Uh, it is a good memory or reminder that the world is very interconnected. Unfortunately, the pandemic is the, is the best or worst example of it in a really weird way. But I think it's also a very important point, uh, Jeff, that I, I believe we learned early, and I hope coming out from this is something that we don't lose. The point you made about kindness, Social media and social networking has a massively, in my opinion, massively positive binding force for the world. At the same time, there were certain business models that tried to capitalize on the negative aspects of it. You know, uh, whether they are uh, uh, the, the commercialized versions of slam books or not so nice business models that capitalize on the ability for people to complain. I hope that people, society and us humans coming out of it learn from people like yourself or you know the, the small voice that I have on social media or, or the messages we share. And we are kinder in what we do online because the ability to have networks that are viral and can propagate or self-propagate 
is a very positive unifying force. And I hope out of this pandemic, we all realize the positive natures of it more than the negative natures of it. Because unfortunately, as you know, that our business model is built on the negative forces of social media. And I really, really hope that coming out of this, our positive voices drown out the negative voices. That's a great point. And, and it's a great, I want to highlight um, a quote from one of your blogs. Again, I think you're just a phenomenal communicator in, in relationship to what's going on with COVID. And, and I quote, we are fighting fear, pain, and anxiety as much as we are fighting the virus. This is our humble attempt to, we'll get into what you guys did, um, to help the thousands of first responders, clerks, rock stars. But I just really want to stick with that kindness theme. You know, I used to, uh, or I still joke, right, that the greatest smile in technology today <laughs> is Arjit from Signal FX. The guys are going to throw up a picture of him. He's a great guy. I mean, he looks like everybody's favorite <laughs> uncle. I love that guy. But yeah. before Signal FX, and actually it's funny, Signal FX also launched on the Cube at Big Data, a Big Data show. I used to say the greatest smile in tech is Avi Meta. I mean, how can you go wrong? And and when I when I reached out to you, I I, I consciously thought, what what more important time do we have than to see people like you with a big smile, with a great positive attitude, focusing on on the positives and. And I just think it's so important and it, it, it segues nicely into what we used to talk about at the strata shows and the big data shows all the time. Everyone wanted to talk about Hadoop and big data. You always stress it's never about the technology, it's about the application of the technology and you focused your company on that. Very with a laser focus from day one. Now it, it's so great to see as we think, you know, the, the bad news about COVID, a lot of bad news, but one of the good news is, is, you know, there's never been as much technology, compute horsepower, mm -hmm. big data, analytics, smart people like yourself to, to bring a whole different set of tools to the battle than just building Liberty ships or building plane, planes or tanks. So you guys have a very aggressive uh, thing that you're doing. Tell us a little bit about it. It's the COVID active transmission, um, the coat, uh, if you will. Tell us about what that is. How did it come to be? And what are you hoping to accomplish? Of course, so first of all, you're too kind. You know, thank you so much. I think you also were one of the first people to give me a hard time about my new or a Twitter picture I put on. <laughs> and you said, what are you doing, Abi? You know, you have a good smile. Come on, give me the smile back. So thank you, you're very kind, Jeff. Um, I think as I, um, uh, as we, as you know, and I know, I think we have a lot to be thankful for in life and there's no reason why we should not smile. Uh, no matter what the circumstance, we have so much to be thankful for. And also, I, and I'm remiss, happy Earth Day, you know, I'm, I'm I'm rocking my green for Earth Day, as well as Ramadan Kareem. Today is the first day of Ramadan, and you know I, I wish uh, everybody in the world Ramadan Kareem. And on that trend, right, on that trend of how does do we as a community come together when faced with crisis? So court was a very simple thing. You know, it's um, I'm thank you for recognizing the hard work of the team that led it. It was an idea. I came up with it. You know, in the shower, I'm like there are two kinds of people or two you, or you can we have we as humans have a choice when history is being made which i do believe i do believe history is being made right whether you look at it economically and a uh, economic shock that we have not felt as humanity since the depression but you look at it socially and again something we haven't seen since the spanish flu history is being made in in these times and i think we as humans have a choice we can either be witnesses to it or play our part in sh helping shape it. And quote was our humble, tiny attempt to, when we look back, say, when history was being made, we chose to not just sit on the sideline, but be a part of trying to be part of the solution. So all we did with quote was take a small idea I had, team gets the entire credit for it, they ran with it. And the idea was, there was a lot of data being open sourced around COVID, a lot of work being done around reporting what is happening, but nothing was being done around reporting or thinking through using the data to predict what could happen with it. And that was code. With code, we tried to make the first code 1.0 that came out almost two weeks ago now, when you first contacted us, was predicting the spread. And the idea around predicting the spread wasn't just saying, here is the number of cases, here are the number of deaths, and know what to be wary of. We wanted to provide, like you know, how firefighters do. Can we predict where it may go to next at a county by county level, so we could create a little bit of a firewall to help it from stop, you know, help the spread of it to be slower. 
in no ways are we claiming that if you did port, you can stop it. But if you could create firewalls around it and distribute tests, not just in areas and cities and counties where it is you know, spiking, but look at the areas and counties where it's about to go to. So we use a in-house in, in uh, network algorithm. We call that Orion. And we were able to start predicting where the virus is going to go to. We also then quickly realized that this could be an interesting, where an extra you know, uh, arrow in the quiver in our fight. We should also think about where are there green shoots around where can recovery be, uh, be helped. So before you know, the, the president came out and announced it was, it was seren, seren, serendipitous, uh, before the, the president came and said, I want to start finding the green shoots to open the country, we then did Code 2.0, which we announced a week ago, with the green shoots around a Tracera recovery index. And the recovery index is looking at, it's kind of like a meta algorithm. We're looking at the rates of change of the rates of change. So if you're seeing the change of the rates of change, you know, the meta part, we're declining, we're saying there are early shoots uh, that we, if, as we plan to reopen our economy in our country, these are the counties to look at first. That was the second attempt with code. And the third attempt we have done is, we're calling it the are, uh, are We There Yet Index. It got announced yesterday, and now you're the first public announcement of it. And the Are We There Yet Index is using the government's definition of the phase one, phase two, phase three. And we are making a prediction on where, which are the counties that are ready to be opened up. And there's good news everywhere in the country. But we, we are predicting there are 73 different counties that as per the government's definition of ready to open, are ready to open. So that's all, you know, we were able to launch the app in five days. Uh, it is free for all first responders, all hospital chains, all not-for-profit organizations trying to help the country through this pandemic, and for-profit operations who want to use the data to get tests out, to get antibodies out, and to get you know, the clinical trials out. So we have made a commitment that we will not charge for uh, code through, to, for any of those organizations to help the country open. Our very, very small attempt to add another dimension to the fight. You know, It's data, it's analytics. I'm not a first responder. This makes me sleep well at night that I'm at least, we're trying to help you know, right. first responder, the true heroes, right? The true heroes. This is our, our humble attempt to help them and recognize that their efforts should not go to waste. Bobby, that, that, that's great because you know, there is data and there is analytics and there is uh, you know, algorithms and the things that we've developed to help people, you know, pick their better next purchase at Amazon or what are they going to watch next on Netflix? And it's such a great application. You know, it's funny, I just finished a book called Ghost Map and it was a story of the cholera epidemic uh, in London in like 1850 something or other, 1854. Oh, wow. um, but what's really interesting at that point in time is they didn't know about waterborne diseases. They thought everything kind of went through the air. And, and it was really a couple of individuals in using data in a new way, and more importantly, mapping different types of data sets on top of it. And now this is it's this, uh, this map that where they basically figured out where the, the pump was that was polluting everybody. But it was a, a great story in you know, kind of changing the narrative by using data mm -hmm. in a new novel and creative way to get to an answer that they couldn't. And you know, there, there's so much data out there, but then there's so short of data. I'm just curious from a data science point of view, you know, um, mm -hmm. you know, there, there there aren't enough tests for you know antibodies. Who's got it? Uh, there aren't enough enough tests for just uh, are you sick? Um, and then you know we're slowly getting the data on the deaths, which is changing all the time. You know, recently announced that the first Bay Area deaths were actually a month mm -hmm. before they before they thought they were. So as you look at, at what you're trying to accomplish, what are some of the great data sets? out there and how are you working around some of the, the lack of data in things like you know, test results? How, how are you kind of organizing, pulling that together? What would you like to see more of? See, that's why I like talking to you. That's why I missed you. You asked these good questions of me. Excellent point. I think there are three things I would like to highlight. Number one, it doesn't take your point that you made with the, with the plethora of technical advances and this S-curve shift that we first spoke at the Cube almost 11 years ago to the date now, or 10 years ago, um, Jeff, the idea of you know, population level law modeling, that cluster computing is finally democratized so everybody can run complicated tests at a unique segment of one. And this is the beauty of what we should be doing in the pandemic. I'm, kind of, I'm, kind of, I'm quite surprised actually, that given the fact that we've had this S-curve shift, what the world calls a combination of cloud computing, 
So on-demand IO and uh, technical resources for processing data, and then the on-demand ability to store and run algorithms at massive scale, we haven't really combined our forces to predict more. You know, that the point you made about uh, the, um, the, uh, the waterborne pandemic in the 18, 1800s. We have an ability as humanity right now to actually see history play out rather than write a book about it, you know, as a past tense. And the three things that are important to do are as follows. Number one, luckily for you and I, the cost of computing an algorithm to predict is manageable. So I am surprised why the large cloud players haven't come out and said, you know what, anybody who wants to distribute anything around predictions related to the pandemic should get cloud resources for free. I, we are running code on all three cloud platforms and I'm paying for all of it, right? That doesn't really make sense. But I'm surprised that they haven't really, you know, joined the debate or contributed to it in, in a way to say, let's make compute free for anybody who would like to add a new dimension to our fight against the pandemic, number one. But the good news is it's available. Number two, there is luckily for us that open data movement, you know, that was started under the Obama administration and hasn't stopped because you can't stop open movements, allows people, companies like ours, to go leverage, you know, whether it's John Hancock, Carnegie Mellon, or the new data coming out of, you know, California universities, a lot of those people are opening up the data. Not every single piece is at the level we would like to see, you know, it's not zip plus four, it's more, mostly county level, but it's available. The third innovation is what we've done with code, but not, it's not an innovation for the world, right? Uh, which is the give get model. So we have said, we will curate everything that's available online at no cost to anybody to use it. But then for purposes and conversations, we want to enrich it. Every organization who gives court data will get more out of it. So we have enabled a data exchange, key part of our software platform, and we're opening up the data exchange that my clients use. But um, you know, we've opened up our data exchange, part of our software platform, and we have open source for this particular case, a give get model, where the more you give to it, the more you get out of it. And our first installations, this was the first week that we have users of the platform. Um, you know, the state of Nevada is using it. Our, our state in North Carolina is using it already. And we're starting to see the first asks for the gift get model to be used. So that's the three ways we're trying to address the problem. That's great. Um, and, 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 and so important, you know, when this, again, when this whole thing started, I, you couldn't help but think of, of the Ford plant making airplanes and, and Kaiser making Liberty ships in, in World War II. But, you know, now this is a different battle, but we have different tools. And to your point, luckily we have a lot of the things in place, right? And we have mobile phones and, you know, we can do Zoom and, we, you know, we can, we can talk as, as we're talking now. So I want to shift gears a little bit and just talk about digital transformation, right? We've been talking about this for, ad nauseum and then and then suddenly right there's this light switch moment for people got to go home and work and people got to uh, communicate via via online tools and you know kind of this talk and this slow movement of of getting people to work from home kind of a little bit and digital transformation a little bit and data driven decision making a little bit but now it's a light switch moment and you guys are involved in some really critical industries like healthcare like financial services when when you kind of look at this not from a you know kind of business opportunity pure, but really more of an opportunity for people to get over the hump and stop. You can't push back anymore. You have to jump in. What are you kind of seeing in the marketplace? How are you know some of your customers uh, dealing with this? Good, bad, and and ugly. Uh, there are two. I want to start my response to you with using two of my favorite sayings that you know come to mind uh, as we started the pandemic. One is you know. Um, Someone very smart said, and I don't know who's been attributed to, but a crisis is a terrible thing to waste. So I do believe this move to restoring the world back to a natural state where there's not much fossil fuels being burnt and humans are a lot careful about their footprint, but even if it's forced, is letting us enjoy the earth and its glory, which is interesting. And I hope we don't waste that opportunity, number one. Number two, Warren Buffett came out and said that it's only when the tide goes out, you realize who's swimming naked. And this is a culmination of both those phenomenal phrases, you know, which is one, this is the moment. I do believe this is something that is deeper, both in the ability for us to realize 
the virtuosity of humanity as a society, as a social species, as well as a, a reality check on what a business model looks like vis-a-vis -a, -vis a presentation that you can put some fancy words on in what has been an 11-year boom cycle and blitz scale your way to disaster. You know, uh, I have said publicly that this, uh, the peak of the cycle was when Mr. Hoffman, Mr. Reed Hoffman wrote the book Blitzscaling. So we should give him a lot of credit for calling the peak in the cycle. So what we are seeing is a kind of coming together of those two, of those two big trends. Crises is going to force industry, as you've heard me say many for many years now, to not just modernize. What we have seen happen, Jeff, in the last few years or decades is modernization, not transformation. And they are different, right? It's the big difference, as you know. Transformation is taking a business model, pulling it apart, understanding the economics that drive it, and then not even reassembling it, recreating how you can either recapture that value or recreate that value completely differently. Or, by the way, blow up the value, create even more value. That hasn't happened yet. Digital transformation, you know, data and analytics, AI, cloud, have been modernizing trends for the last 10 years, not transformative trends. In fact, I've also gone and said publicly that today, the very definition of technology transformation is run a SQL engine in the cloud and you get a big check off as a technology organization saying, I'm good, I've transformed how I look at data analytics, I'm doing what I was doing on-prem in the cloud. So it's still SQL in the cloud, you know, there's a, big, a very successful company that has made a business model out of it. You don't need to talk about the company today, but I think this becomes that moment where those business models truly, truly get a chance to transform, number one. Number two, I think there's gonna be, so that's on the industrial side. On the new company side, I think the, 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 the era of anointing winners by saying grow at all cost, economics don't matter, is fundamentally over. Uh, I believe that the peak of that was the book called Bliss Scaling. Uh, the, the, you know, the markets always follow the peaks you know, a little later. But you and I, in our lifetimes, will see the, the return to fundamentals. Fundamentals, as you know, never go out of fashion. Jeff, whether it's good conversations, whether it's human values or it's economic models, if you do not have a path to being a profitable, contributing member of society, whether that is running a good balance sheet individually and not driven by debt or running a good balance sheet as a company. You know, we call it financial jurisprudence. Financial jurisprudence never goes out of fashion. And the fact that even when we became the mythical animal, which is not the point that we became a unicorn, we were a profitable company three years ago and two years ago and four years ago and today and will end this year as a profitable company. I think it's a very, very nice moment for the world to realize that within the realm of digital transformation, even the new companies that can leverage and push that trend forward can build profitable business models from it. And if you don't, it doesn't matter if you have a billion users. As my economics professor told me, selling a watermelon that you buy for a dollar for 50 cents, even if you sell that a billion times, you cannot make it up in volume. I think those are two things that will fundamentally change the trend from modernization to transformation. It is coming, and this will be the moment when we will look back, and when you write a book about it, that people will say, you know what? No, Jeff called it. And, that, and, the, and the pandemic is what drove the economic jurisprudence as much as the social jurisprudence. Avi, you touched on so many things there. We can, we're going to be, we're going to go Joe Rogan. We're going to be here for four hours. So hopefully, uh, hopefully you're in a comfortable chair. But, um, but you <laughs> stand up, on... stand up desk. I, I don't, I don't sit anymore. I love standing up. Oh, do you do day, the you know? stand up desk? But I, I do the stand up desk. My version of your watermelon story was, you know, I worked at at a, a couple of, you know, kind of high growth, spend a lot of money, raise a lot of money startups back in the day. And I just thought, mm -hmm. finally, we were working so hard. I'm like, well, why don't we just go up to the street? and sell dollars for 90 cents with a card table and a comfy chair and maybe some iced tea. And we'll drive revenue like there's nobody's business and lose less money than we're losing now and not have to work so hard. I mean, it's so in interesting. <laughs> I mean, I think it, as you said, everyone's kind of, you know, kind of uh, this pump the brakes moment. 
as well, growth at the, at, the, at the cost of everything else, right? There used to be a great concept called triple line accounting, right? Mm -hmm. Which is not mm -hmm. just shareholder value to the, to the sacrifice of everything else, but also mm -hmm. your customers and your uh, employees and, and, and your community and being a, a good steward uh, and a good participant in, in what's going on. And I think that a lot of that got lost. Another, you know, to your point about pumping the brakes and the and the environment, um, I mean mm -hmm. it's been kind of entertaining uh, on the oil side watching an unprecedented supply shock followed literally within days by an unprecedented demand shock. But but the fact now that when everyone's not driving to work at nine in the morning, we actually mm -hmm. have a lot more infrastructure than we thought, and and you know kind of goes back to the old Ma Bell capacity planning issue. But, but why are all these technology workers? driving to work every morning at, at nine o'clock. I mean, it's one thing if you're a service provider or you got to go work at a restaurant or you're you're carrying a truck full of, of tools, but mm -hmm. for people that just go sit on a laptop all day, makes absolutely no sense. And and I love your point that people are now, you know, seeing things a little bit slowed down. Um, you know, you can hear birds chirp. You're, you're not just stuck in traffic. And and to, and to your point on the, the digital transformation, right? I mean, difference between revolution and evolution and revolution people get killed. And mm -hmm. you know, the fact that digital is not the same as physical, but it, 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 it's different. Um, had Ben Nelson on talking about the changes in education. He had the great quote, I've been using it for weeks now, right? That a car is not a, is not a mechanical horse, right? It's really mm -hmm. an opportunity to rethink the, you know, rethink the objective and design a new solution. So it is a really historical moment. I think it is, it's really interesting that we're all going through it together as well, right? It's not like the earthquake in 89 or I was in Mount St. Helens and that blew up in, in 1980 where you had kind of a yeah. population that was involved in the event. Now it's a global thing. Where were you in March, 2020? And we've all gone through this Indeed. thing together. So hopefully it is a little bit of a, of more of a unifying um, factor. And, and, and kind of the final thought, since we're referencing great books and authors and quotes, right, as you've all, uh, Noah Harari and Sapiens talked about what is culture, right? Culture is, is basically, it's, it's a narrative that we all have bought into. And I find it so ironic that in the year 2020 that we always joke is 2020 hindsight, we quickly found out that everything we thought was suddenly wasn't. And the fact that the, mm -hmm. the global narrative changed literally within days, um, you know, really a lot spearheaded right here in Santa Clara County with with Dr. Sarah Cody shutting down groups of more than 150 people, which is about four days before they went to the full shutdown. It is a really interesting time, but as you said, you know, if you're fortunate enough as we are to, you know, have a few bucks in the bank and have a business that can be digital, which you can if you're in the sports business or the travel business, the hotel business, mm -hmm. the restaurant business, a lot of, a lot of, uh, a lot of not not good stuff happening there, but. For those of us that can, it is an opportunity to, to do this nice, you know, kind of a reset and, and use the powers that we've developed for recommendation engines uh, for really a much more powerful, for good. Uh, for good. And, and you're doing a lot more stuff too, right? With banking and in, in uh, healthcare. Telemedicine is one of my favorite things, right? We've been talking about telemedicine and electronic medicine for now. Well, guess what? Now you have to, because the hospitals mm -hmm. are, over, are overflowing. Yeah. Now, Jeff, to your point, three stories, and you know, then at some point, I know you have. You, I, I will let you go. You can let me go. I can talk to you for four hours. I can talk to you for for days, my friend. You know, the three stories that that have been very relevant to me through this crisis. Uh, you know, one is first. I think I guess in a way, all are personal. But uh, the first one, you know, that I always like to remind people on, there were business models built around allowing people to complain online, and then using that as almost like a a, a stick. To, to find a way to commercialize it. And I look at that, all of our friends, and I'm sure you have friends, I have lots of friends in the restaurant industry, and how much they are struggling, right? They are honest working. The hardest thing to do in life, as I've been told, and I've witnessed through my friends, is to run a restaurant. The hours, the effort you put into it, making sure that what you produce is, is not just edible, but is good quality, is enjoyed by people, is sanitary, is a hard thing to do. And there was, yet there were all of these people, you know, who would not find in, in their heart or in their minds for two seconds to go post a review if something wasn't right and be brutal in those reviews. And if they were, if the same people were to look back now and think about have they, the soul, the, those same souls, done anything to be supportive for our restaurant workers? You know, it's easy to go and slam them uh, online, but this is our chance 
to let a part of the industry that we all depend on, food, right, critical to humanity's success. What have we done to support them? As easy as it was for us to complain about them, what have we done to support them? And I truly hope and I believe that coming out of it, those business models don't work anymore. And before we are ready to go on and online on our phones and complain about, well, it took time for the bread to come to my table, we think twice, how hard are they working, right? Number one, that's my first story. I really hope you do something about that. My second story is to your, have we changed the way we will work? My kids, I'm sure as your kids, get up every morning, get dressed, and launch you know, their online version of a classroom. Do you think when they enter the workforce or when they go to college, you and me are going to try and convince them to get in a oil burning combustion engine that by the way, can have, can crash, can break down, can impact your health, impact the environment and show up to work. And, and they'll say, what do you talk about? What are you talking about? I can be effective. I can learn virtually. Why can't I contribute virtually? So I think there'll be a generation of the next class of you know, contributors to society who are now raised to live in an environment where the choice of making sure we preserve the planet and yet contribute towards the growth of it is no longer a binary choice. Both can be done. So I completely agree with you. We have fundamentally changed how our kids, when they grow up, will go to work and contribute, right? My third story is the thing you said about how many industries are suffering. We have clients, you know, in the, so we have healthcare customers, we have banking customers, you know, we have, uh, who, have you know, who are paying their bills like we are, are doing everything they can to do right by society. And then we have customers in the industry of travel hospitality. And one of my most humbling moments, Jeff, was one of the you know, C-level executives sent us an email early in this, you know, uh, in this crisis and said, this is a moment where a strong David can help a weak Goliath. And just reading that email had me very emotional because there are not very many moments that we get as corporations, as businesses, where we can be there for our customers when they ask us to be there for them. And if we as companies can help our customers, our clients, who at the end of the day are flying people, are feeding people, are taking care of their health and their wealth, if we in this moment can be there for them, we, we don't forget those moments. You know, those, as, as humans have long-term memories, right? That was one of the, the kindest, gentlest reminders to me that what was more important to me, my co-founder, Richard, you know, my leadership team, every single person at Traceda that have tried very hard to build automations, because as an automation company, to automate complex human process so we can make humans do higher order activities. In the moment when our customers asked us to contribute and be there for them, I said yes. They said yes. You said yes. And I hope, I hope people don't forget that, that unicorns aren't important. They are mythical animals. There's nothing mythical about profits. There's nothing mythical about fortress balance sheet. And there's nothing mythical about a strong business model that is built for sustainable growth, not growth at all costs. And those are my three stories that, you know, bring me a lot of, lot of calm in this Im tremendous moment of strife. And, and, and the piece that wraps up all those is, is ultimately it's about relationships, right? People don't do business mm -hmm. with, I mean, companies don't do business with companies. People do business with people. And, and it's those relationships and, and, and strong relationships through, through the bad times, which really set us up for when things start to come back. Mm -hmm. Avi, as always, it's, I'm not going to let it be three years to the next time you hear me uh, <laughs> pounding on your door. Great to catch up. You know, love to love to watch really your, your culture building and, and your community engagement. Good luck. I mean, great success on the company, but really that's one thing. I think you really do a phenomenal job of, of just keeping this positive drumbeat. You always have, you always will, and really appreciate you uh, taking some time on a Friday to, uh, to sit down with us. Well, th first of all, thank you. I wish that I could tell you I dressed up for you, but we celebrate formal Fridays at Traceda, um, and that's what this is. Also, I want to end on a, good, on a positive bit of news. I was going to give you a demo of it, but if you want to go to our website um, and look at what everything we're doing, we have a survival kit around, a data survival kit around COVID. 
I don't like using buzzwords, you know, AI, so let's not use that buzzword right now. But uh, in, your, in your lovely state, one of my favorite places on the planet, uh, when we ran the algorithm on who is ready, as per the government definition of opening up, we have five counties that are ready to be opened, you know, between Santa Clara, Tular, Sacramento, Kern, and San Francisco. The metrics today, the data today, with our algorithm, you know, our meta algorithm, is saying that those five counties, those five regions, look like have done a lot of positive activities if the country was to open under all the right circumstances. Those five look, you know, the first, as we would recommend, as Kareem, happy Earth Day, a pleasure to see you. So good to know your family is doing well. And I hope we, we, we talk to each other soon. Thanks, Avi. Great conversation with Avi Mehta, uh, terrific guy. Thanks for watching. Everybody stay safe. Have a good weekend. Uh, Jeff Frick checking out from theCUBE. Thank you.